Wow, this is so exciting. Hello, everybody. My name is Sector. I'm an iOS developer at Spotify. I work in features like album, artist, uh, the start page, or I have developed other filters that, or components that you might have used. Um, my talk today is not something super technical. I'm not going to dive into compiler flags or that sort of stuff. I'm going to share with you the process and our practices of how we develop our application. And I want to share, you, uh, I want to share with you this because lots of companies are having are scaling and are having problems with scale. So let's get started. This is my agenda. So I'm going to go quickly through some numbers. I'm going to tell you about some problems that we have faced with scale. Uh, I'm going to tell you about some everyday strategies that we, that we use in the company and some of the actual results of these strategies. I'm missing the Taylor Swift references, because you know that there's no Taylor Swift at Spotify. <laughs> so we have a user base of 60 million users that are listening about 30 million songs. Um, and they create like a bunch of playlists, like billions of playlists. And, and we are available in eight, eight, 58 markets, including Germany. And this is how our iOS client looks in numbers. So it's a, it's a project of 500,000 lines of code. We have an average number of contributors to the repository of 40 developers. And as I said, we have a user base of millions of users. So if you screw up, then it's pretty bad. This is how, this is how the project started in, uh, in terms of um, number of developers. As any other application, it started with a small number of developers, then somebody else joined, then somebody was poached by some other company, and it just keeps scaling and scaling and scaling until right now, lately, we have almost 50, 50 developers for the application. And as the scale has grown up, also our problems have scaled up as well. And I'm going to go through these problems. The first one, the first one was a very big problem on merge branches. So you have your master branch. You usually uh, fork from it, branch from it, work on your future, and when you're ready, you merge back to master. Uh, the problem is that master, in our case, is moving so fast we have sometimes hundreds of commits happening per day. And some of these futures were actually not going back to master. Well, it's OK if it happens every now and then. But the problem was that it, happened, it was happening too often. Uh, it was just too difficult to merge back, and it was impossible to rebase. Actually, it was a pretty grim scenario, uh, such that 70% of the, of the branches never got back to master. So we were wasting 70% of all our development effort. And just the 30% reached the user in the end. So we came with a big solution, which is called future toggles. This means that, well, we keep developing these futures, but we, we work on them in very small chunks. And we merge back to master really often. This means that even in master, even in the client that you're using right now, there are incomplete futures of us and code that maybe is not finished. But it doesn't matter, because through our future flags or future toggles, we can just hide it behind it. So out in the wild, we have a, a pretty solid backend system where we can just roll, up any, roll out any future to a specific market, to a number of users. And then if something goes wrong, if you observe, let's say, uh, crash reports or some metrics that doesn't look healthy, we can roll them back. Of course, problems never happen, right? And, and this is what, is what I like most about this, is that if we ever 
if we ever make a big mistake, then we, we can contain that, that mistake. So we start deploying maybe 1%, 5%, 25%, 50%. And in case, well, in case we see something going wrong, we can just roll back and, and then fix it and ship it back later with our fixes. So, what was the result of this? Well, the result was that now 90% of our code that branches from master is, is merged back. And, well, that looks pretty healthy. Now we're just losing 10% of experiments that didn't work out or something like that. And, um, well, I want to share also, uh, it's not here in my slides, but I want to share also how, how do we manage our branches nowadays regarding releases. We used to have a master branch and we used to have a release branch, which we stabilized for maybe one week. But nowadays we're in a point that master is pretty healthy and we can just deploy to the app store whenever we, we need to. Right now this happens twice a week. And I'm going to tell you a few strategies of how, how this was possible. But through nightly builds for our employees, we gather lots of runtime, and we're able to deploy almost continuously if it was not for the App Store. Now, the second big problem that we had is what I called the Big Blob Xcode project. So imagine 50 developers working in an Xcode project. How does it look like? Well, it started to look very painful. Uh, as, as any other project, it started with something small that just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And at some point, it was like this big, scary, untamable beast that it was just impossible to work with. We had lots of merge conflicts, and we had not very clear boundaries of what is yours, what is my responsibility, and this was a big problem. So, what was the solution for this? Well, the solution for this was what we call our future system. And this means that we are replicating or, or modeling our Xcode or workspace um, pretty much how our companies model. So, we have this big workspace in Xcode, and we have smaller projects for each of our futures. So, you can find futures like Search, Radio, browse, social, discover, whatever. And, and each future is pretty much contained into, the, into their own project. So you are able to just work in whatever you are, uh, your team is, let's say discover. And you really don't care about what the other persons are doing. Because we interact with them through uh, public APIs. So, well, if you ever need something from, let's say, the music player, they have their public API. And, well, you don't really care about how they do that. You just care what you're getting from them. And this is, well, and this, this also enables us to uh, compile some parts of the application as frameworks, as static libraries, and reuse them for prototyping or other purposes, or for distributing our SDK, which you can find in GitHub. And these are, these are very, very big problems. Um, we have these clever solutions for them. But how, how does our everyday work look like? Well, I'm going to tell you about these everyday strategies. Um, and it's a story about how, how a plan is transformed into code and goes to the user. So everything starts with our agile flavor culture. And I say it's a flavor, because it's not Scrum or it's not Kanban. It's whatever works for your future team. There are, there are teams that are very experienced and that don't need much uh, overhead on planning and meetings. And there are other younger teams that are less experienced and need a little bit more of help and a little bit more of structure to guide themselves. So it's a little bit different from any team. But once it's planned, well, it can be a bug fix, it can be a small future, it can be any change. This plan is turned into a piece of code, and it's implemented by someone like you, or like me, a developer. And this is where everything starts at Spotify. The first step 
is our, our repository and our model for contribution. We're currently, currently using GitHub Enterprise, and our, con our form of contribution and interaction follows the same model as, um, as open source. So it's like an internal open source model. You see one project, or you're working on one project, you fork it, you make your changes, and then when you're done with it, you submit a pull request, which is um, code reviewed by the authors. That's the second step, peer code review. So everybody has been through, uh, in this position. You got, you got your fabulous piece of code, you think it's perfect, and then here comes your reviewer, which probably disagrees on the perfection of it, but together with him or her, you can iterate through it and improve quality. And this is, this is a key point in, in our code reviews. Then, well, everybody's happy, and you carry on. But why is it important? As I said, it's important because you improve quality and you spread knowledge. And since, as I said, we are separated by futures, sometimes it's a little bit invisible what other teams are working on. So they help us prevent work from being repeated. Uh, well, there are opportunity to detect errors earlier, and there are venue for technical discussions. Not personal opinions, but technical discussions. And at the same time that your review is happening, our continuous integration machinery is also happening. Well, we're using right now Team City with pretty good results. Uh, well, it eases integration use, uh, issues and gives us notifications and stats like code coverage or if a test fails, well, you and everybody else can find out why. So it gives us clues of when, when things went wrong. Uh, sometimes it can happen that maybe you go on holidays, but it's there for everybody still to check it out. And it also executes our suite of tests. So unit tests, we do that a lot. And why are they important? How do, how do we do them? Well, mainly we, we focus unit tests for model and model view layers, and they are our first channel of feedback for regressions. Uh, they can also be executed in the developer's machine, so even if you are re working remotely or without access to internet while you travel, you can still have the unit test um, behind you. And just writing testable code leads to better code, in my opinion. So, well, uh, you're surely going to find regressions every now and then, but maybe every now and then doesn't feel like it's worth it. But I feel unit test, the real, one of the additional values that is not mentioned often is that it changes how you see your code and how you design it and implement it. And that's why I think testable code is better code, because it makes you think how to do it. And after, after this unit test, then we have our automated tests. We execute them in, oh, sorry. We execute them in all the platforms that we support in several different configurations, like, well, different space on hard drive and different network conditions. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like robots like clicking things, but it looks like this. <laughs> but it gets the job done. And how we use them is we use them to test the views, uh, the view layers and user interfaces of the application. And as I said, they are executed on all the supported devices. And then when all this has happened, all your unit tests have, um, have been executed, they're green, your automated tests are, have passed, your reviews uh, are positive, then your code is merged back to master. And now it's ready to go out in the wild and reach your users. Of course, well, there is QA, um, but, well, now it's out for the users to, to reach out. 
But this, this is not the end of the story, of course. After this, the job of the developer is not finished, and the next part is to monitor crashes, which, of course, doesn't happen often in the wild. And we're using right now Crashlytics with pretty good results. Uh, we're also using Crashlytics to do our beta distribution for employees and nightly builds. Um, and we're also using it to distribute the application to our testers. And we're pretty happy with the, with the tool. Of course, you have TAs, you have quality assurance, but I, in my opinion, uh, you as the developer, you are the main responsible person for the quality of your code. So every, every developer has the responsibility to every now and then go to crash lyrics and see that you're not introducing a crash or a big bug in, your, in the application. And what are the results of all this? Like, how do we measure if this, if this is getting us into the right direction? Well, now we have a shorter release cycle that went from three weeks to two weeks. And we have a very promising trend on our crash frequency. I have a graph here since version 1.9 about our number of crashes per 1,000 plays. And well, it's moving in the right direction. And finally, this is a very important metric, our App Store rating. One year, one year and a half ago, we used to have ratings uh, in the average of three stars, three and a half. And right now, in most markets, we have a rating of five stars, except in France, where we have 4.5 stars. It's a very demanding market. <laughs> um, but in general, and if you read our reviews and our, our comments in the App Store, people are much more happy about how they're listening music now. Um, this is what I want you to take from this talk, is that all these practices have improved our product a lot, and, and, you, can carry, and you, can, you can implement them even if you are an individual developer, even if you're a big company or a mid-sized company. Uh, I just released an application in the App Store, and I tried to replicate all these processes in a DIY scale. So, well, instead of Team City, which I don't know how much it costs, but I imagine it's not cheap, I'm using Xcode bots, which is free and is shipped with Xcode. Instead of, um, well, for unit tests, you use Xcode, so there is no difference there. But I don't have a farm of devices, but I can use Kif which is open source, and I can use it in a simulator. Crashlytics is still free, and I can do A-B tests or A-B rollouts using CloudKit or other services, which can be free, like Optimizely. So I want to invite everybody to just give a try to some of these practices. It's, it's not easy just to execute them all or implement them all at once, but maybe you can start with code reviews if you don't do it, and then keep uh, upping your game and relying more on automation and testing and make a better application for your users. And that's what I wanted to tell you about today. Thank you.